I'd love to take five or ten minutes worth of questions if people have them. And I see Vanna White back there right in the middle. So uh, nobody has any questions about leak detection. I can't believe that. Glenn, right behind you. Folks, as an interstate gas pipeline landowner, a question I have, because I am the last line of leak detection. If something goes wrong and nothing else catches it, I'm the guy that's going to make the call to the operator or to 911. Tell me a little bit about how pre prepared we are to take that call. Okay. Yeah, my name is Doug Sauer again. Uh, so I'm not in the gas industry, but I'm a liquids operator. Um, so so I, at the risk of not necessarily speaking for them, I'll tell you how we would do that. Um, the pu public engagement and the public role, it's a valuable piece of being able to detect problems uh, for us. And so we're a tw we have a 24-7 control center, always staffed. And uh, we have phone numbers posted on our pipeline marketers along our pipeline route. So uh, that we expect or encourage and, and expect if, if the public sees something abnormal in the vicinity of our pipeline, whether they smell an odor or they see something or they hear something that just isn't normal, or they may see uh, some excavation activity that's right close to our pipeline and there's nobody from the pipeline there. Uh, the line's not flagged and marked. That's a risk, right? Perhaps that person's acting outside of the law and didn't notify 811 so that the pipeline or any of the utilities could be located. Um, we definitely need the public to help us detect those kinds of problems. And so simply call the phone, the phone number, uh, uh, somebody will always answer that. It's typically the, the controller on duty. And once they know your location, they can identify which pipeline of ours is, is the closest one to where you're located. And then we can, we can manage that. And we would want to get your contact information and stay in dialogue so that we can follow it all the way through to make sure that we don't have a problem with our pipeline system. All right, I've got a microphone and I'm asking the next question, sorry. Um, a quick question, hopefully easy question for Mark. Is the, as you're doing your research up at CIFR, are you sharing the results with the vendors that are right now so they can improve their technology and or is there an expectation that at some point these studies will be made public? So the vendors are finding out how they're doing so that they can use that information to make sure that we're reporting consistently with what they think they're reporting and to help them improve. I think the long-term plan is that this information that is now confidential will make its way into the public domain, but it's just a matter of time. I mean, these tests are expensive, the programs are expensive. What industry, our industry partners are looking to do is expand the scope, bring other participants in to fund further research, and then at some point in time, yes, I think the expectation is that this information will see the light of day beyond the funders. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you think that as uh, part of uh, Vision 2021 for FUMSA um, that you guys will start to dictate some leak detection standards in terms of uh, minimum performance, technology, uh, and response? Yeah, I would say the only closest start we have is with that rupture detection rule where at least we'll start what the definition of a rupture is. I think anything else goes to kind of what Alan said, that whole balance of performance versus prescription. It gets very challenging when you, you start putting requirements. For instance, if you push sensitivity way too low or way too high, one or the other, you start having more missed calls, things like that, unintended consequences, so you have to be careful of that. Um, but, you know, who knows? Maybe that's where we need to go. Um, I think some of the more pie-in-the-sky type stuff would be interesting. Uh, you know, drones always come up, too. One is, you know, there are regulatory requirements on FAA clearance. I would say the other part of that is they probably become target practice for some landowners. So you could fly over more regularly, so maybe that's a public awareness piece. The satellite part is kind of interesting. You know, if we want to be the best in the world, let's, let's step it up a notch and be the best in the universe. Let's start figuring out how to in, um, involve those satellites more to do irregular scans. Clearly that involves NASA, others, things like that. Maybe we can get Elon Musk on that or something like that. But. Um, yeah, and then, you know, some other thoughts, too, on, on other things going on. It, you know, it's, we don't know yet, but 
uh, it'll be interesting to see where we go in the ability to drive innovation. I think the problem with driving innovation, though, it, it can get costly. So, um, so yeah, like anything else, that's where our fund rulemaking process comes on and cost-benefit analyses. Having said that, we are on the hook. We're continuing on the hook with our um, the 2011 Act mandates and others on pushing those standards. One thing we are doing is, like in my slides, trying to work with the standards to push some of those requirements so it's vetted through the standard process, but hopefully getting them, like standards we incorporate already in a regulation, trying to get them to push the envelope a little bit as well. So those are just some ideas. I had a question sort of analogous to what Carl asked of uh, David Shaw on, on looking at these uh, analyses with the, the, with the detectors uh, in terms of uh, driving that detection limit down um, because you can't, you can't have somebody like uh, Max Kiba regulating stuff before they could be, it can be detected at that level reliably. On the other hand, if you don't have Max saying, you gotta do it now, then it's harder to get that funding or get the driving force. And, and how do you see that going forward? What, what are the key levers to making it better? Um, this is a massively complicated question, actually. Uh, th th at a certain point, every technology that we use, which is based on some sort of physical principle, is going to be limited by the physics. I mean, so, um, we're getting, for example, some impressive results with the fiber optic technologies down below 1%, but you're going to get into the area where uh, the physics of the situation is simply, going to, is, is simply going to limit it. So it's back to Max's point about cost versus uh, technology versus requirements. And so one difficulty, I guess, with, with imposing firm standards is that not every requirement is the same. I mean, you, you, you need, for example, you need um, a very high reliability and sensitivity on a interstate high volume pipeline for sure. But do you really need the same when it's a um, water gathering line in the middle of the desert? I mean, you really just don't know. So in any case, I, I guess the answer to your question, I think, is that there's a, 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 a minimum level of physics, which, which is going to be insuperable. And so driving that level down on the technical side is just going to be not just difficult, but impossible. <laughs> so. Yeah, just to chime in, I, I think it's important to figure out where that floor is for the different technologies directionally so that FIMSA can make reasonable guidance in terms of what the expectation is. And I think the jury's still out on that for a number of technologies. So efforts to figure out what they can see conclusively uh, is, is really important to inform everybody involved in what regulation should, should look like. All right. Okay, when you're doing this elder um, apparatus thing here, whatever you call it, do you use different aged pipes during your experiment? Right, so the testing assumes, regardless of the age of the pipeline, that leaks could be possible. So we are simply staging controlled releases. We are not making any judgments on whether those leaks are more likely in new pipes versus old pipes. That's not what the focus is. The focus is to determine if a leak happens in any pipeline, how likely is it to be detected? The whole issue of how likely is a leak to occur is certainly important, but that's sort of the likelihood side of the equation. We're kind of looking at it from the consequence side, which is if it happens, how quickly will it be detected? How quickly will it be dealt with? And that is all about managing the amount of environmental impact that happens if it comes out. But the point you're raising or implying, which is how likely is it, is a separate issue and really important. And arguably that's been the focus of industry till this point, keep it in the pipe, We'll do everything we can through integrity management and design to try and make it not come out. But if it does, then how bad will it be? And so these are technologies meant to make it less bad by making less come out by detecting it sooner. At least that's the driver behind these initiatives to improve leak detection technology. 
Yeah, and I'll just add from the R&D perspective, David could probably talk about this more, but that's one of the things we're looking for in that leak detection system design redundancy, et cetera. So getting the corrosion people, the O&M people, to talk more to your leak detection people. So the idea is putting up a matrix of, okay, what kind of corrosion you have on a line, things like that to help, and are you an HDA or not? Factoring that into an overall matrix, what kind of leak detection, to try to give at least the operator some ideas of where you should be focusing on, particularly if you have a aging line, um, corrosion issues, things like that. So we are looking at that. It's probably gonna turn out to be some kind of guidance document and where it goes from there, we don't know, but. Hi, Mr. Shaw, um, in the 2012 leak detection study, you made a statement to the effect of the need for performance standards of some sort to be able to move the industry forward in terms of safety performance. Can you just elaborate on that a little more in terms of your need, the need for safety standards? Yes, and uh, I don't want to uh, o overstate this because uh, certainly for internal systems, there, there are recommended practices for evaluating and assessing and predicting the performance of of the leak detection system. These, all these uh, jargon words flash by on the slides, but there's API publication 1149, there's the recommended practice 1130. People have got a book that they can go to and they can make an assessment of the likely expected performance. The, 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 the curves that Doug showed you are, are predictive curves of, of likely performance of a CPM, for example. Now, I, again, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but for external systems, that's almost entirely, almost entirely lacking. And that's the, the thrust of, of Mark's research. So it would be fantastic if we could begin to do some of that um, recommended practice development uh, for external systems in general. Um, again, it's not that bleak. Again, thanks to FIMSA, there is a program with this, we're that far away from a recommended practice. So there's a program to figure out how we would evaluate uh, natural gas uh, de detection systems. So just even how I would specify the performance of a natural gas detection system is something that's an open area of, of research and FIMSA is, is doing some of that. But I do very strongly think that that's the next thing we need. We need uh, recommended practices for external systems too.